After my first game of Icarus, I was so enraptured by the two hours of crazed creativity that we experienced and the story that we had created, I honestly wanted to sit down with a laptop and start typing out the novelization. The pure inspirational energy that was flowing around the room as we saw the story of our crumbling city unfold itself before us was so enthralling that if I was confident that you were able to grab a copy of this game and experience that atmosphere for yourself 100%, then I would honestly be happy for you to just go out and buy this game with our recommendation right now before the title card even runs. Things, however, might not be quite that simple. And also, I put a lot of effort into this video. So to really explain this game to you, I'm gonna not only be showing you how to play, but also recounting the story of the first time that I played Icarus. Icarus is a boxed one-shot RPG from designer Spencer Stark in which you will be collaboratively telling the story of a great civilization and the events that led to its inevitable collapse. Two to five players will be working together to tell their Icarus's story, embodying notable figures and enactors of social change from the society that they formed. The most immediately obvious thing that sets Icarus apart from a lot of the RPGs that you may have already tried is that in Icarus you'll be playing without a games master or referee or DM or whatever you'd like to call the person who's been running the show in whatever games you've played before. That means instead of one person describing the world, story and events with a group of players acting and reacting in turn, you will instead be acting as a council of storytellers all collectively building the world around you and then working together to bring it down. The first part of that world that you'll all need to decide on is the setting. Whilst the rulebook for Icarus comes with a healthy amount of diverse scenarios for you to delve into, much like one of my other favorite RPGs, Ten Candles, you can adapt this rule set to pretty much any setting that you can think of. Following the options in the book, you could be anything from Wild West colonists to citizens of a sci-fi megacity or denizens of some fantasy magical plane. For our incarnation of the damn city, we chose to play through the rising singularity scenario in which the booming futuristic city of Icarus was the first to recognize the equal rights of synthetic life forms, the cooperation of human life and artificial intelligence, leading to a massive economic and technical growth spurt, which left the rest of the world in the dust, far behind the advanced megacity of Icarus. Once your setting has been established, it's time to find out what makes your society so great. Drawing from a deck of these pillar cards, you'll find out the key definers of your city or civilization. You might be famed for your incredible architecture, for your systems of law, or your famed skills in diplomacy. You'll be drawing one card for every player around the table, plus one extra, which will be used later. Then, each player around the table will select the card that excites them the most, and write down one of these pieces of paper called Aspects. Why Icarus sees that card they've selected as one of the pillars of their society and answering the question that the card poses on these pieces of paper. One of the players around the table though will be flipping that on its head and instead explaining why that card they've picked is a weakness in your society. Once you've started to write these down, you'll already be getting a pretty strong sense of what your society is and how it functions. During the, uh, the agriculture card, I explained that during our technological revolution, we developed a 3D printing system that could generate food for the population out of easy to source materials, completely replacing our need for traditional farming and livestock. During the social structure card, Dean decided that the city of Icarus was kept safe by a well-respected police force who recognized authority was the linchpin of Icarus's peaceful society. And finally, with two of our three players deciding strengths of the civilization we formed, Astrid took the education card to declare that an algorithmic AI-led education system was secretly favoring the synthetic life forms in the city, creating an invisible class system that created tension between organic and synthetic citizens. 
Once the pillars of your society have been established, players will then be drawing from a deck of motive cards that you'll be combining with your pillar card to create your character for this session. You might, for example, draw a motive card that sees your character working to get rich. Combine that with the energy pillar and you might become an aggressive oil baron that fuels the town's furnaces and economy. Drawing Protect the Citizens motive, I became Thane, the human leader of Icarus's research and development department and pioneer of the 3D printed agriculture project. Dean, drawing the Bring Down Icarus motive, became Silas, the synthetic police commissioner. Finally, Astrid drew Protect the Leaders card and became Abacus, a showdown style artificial intelligence that runs the city's logistics and education programs, interwoven into the fabric of the city and entirely self centered, unbeknownst to the city's inhabitants. The final pillar card that was put aside when each player was choosing one to look after during the setup will be acting as the inspiration for your monument. The monument is a physical reminder of the prowess of your city or civilization that will be constructed throughout the game. With the knowledge of the society that you've built and pillar cards that you've assigned to it, you'll all be asking one question as a group. What is the monument's function? Perhaps a modern day city's communication monument should be some huge satellite tower, or an ancient prehistoric society would erect a huge statue of their god when drawing on the religion card. As we assigned the artistic expression pillar to our monument, we imagined an enormous procedurally generated art piece that would extend ever upwards into the sky, generated by the algorithm inside Abacus, and signifying the unique equal footed relationship between organic and synthetic lives inside Icarus. The monument doesn't just exist in the story. Players will be physically building the monument out of these chunky rounded edge dice throughout the game, stacking each die one on top of the other in a single unstable column. A physical representation of not just the monument that your city is constructing, but also your teetering fragility as the society stands on the brink of destruction. This is where Icarus starts to get very clever, using, as RPGs often do, the simple tools of paper, cards and dice to evoke an incredibly tangible story. The last part of your setup is making a pool of these chunky dice and constructing a story deck. Icarus comes with a deck of cards in three different categories, the cracks in our facade, the rifts between us, and the final hours. You'll draw a number of these and form a deck of problems that your city or civilization will face in the lead up to its destruction, getting progressively more impactful and drastic as you get further down the deck, until you reach a black backed card, simply named The Bitter End. To kick things off, you'll draw two of these cards and you'll describe events happening in Icarus and a question to answer. You'll collectively decide on the problem that has arisen and write it down on a piece of paper to accompany the card and place it on the table. These events are just vague enough that they'll work in any setting you place them in, but also interesting enough as hypotheticals that you'll start to flesh out your society and its story even more with each one drawn. Perhaps a valuable resource that the city requires as an import has become exorbitantly expensive. How does that affect the economy or the people that live there? Maybe a wave of crime has sprung up throughout the civilization. Who's causing it and what does it mean for the future of Icarus? In our gleaming city streets, there was an undercurrent of civil unrest. Small pockets of human citizens were beginning to realize the social imbalance between themselves and the synthetic life forms that they shared the city with. As if that wasn't enough of a problem for the notion of peace, a climate crisis saw the arrival of a massive rolling storm approaching the city limits. The reports told of acid rain and electrical discharges causing huge damage to those that had passed over already. Once the setup of a game of Icarus is done, you'll likely have acquainted yourself pretty well with the fictional society that you've been building, and it honestly doesn't take long to get very immersed in the setting and the story that you're constructing together. 
Icarus is a bed for rampant creativity, and that continues as your city or civilization starts to evolve over the course of the game. After the setup, you'll be playing through rounds in which each player around the table gets to take control of the narrative and imprint their mark on it. First, they'll grab a die from the supply and select one of the aspects around the table on which they'd like their character to act. Perhaps that crime wave that you've been experiencing in your city needs a firm political hand to enact real, tangible change, and your character is just the person for the job. Maybe you'd actually benefit from the escalation of the crime because you supply the private military contract that the city uses to enforce justice on its people, and you want to get those fires burning even brighter. Maybe you just like to help or hinder one of the other characters around the table by lending your die to their cause to increase their odds, or try to break down their positive efforts. Once you've decided your action for the turn, you'll also draw a new card as another event strikes Icarus. As I mentioned before, the cards escalate as you move through the deck, moving from the first, more tame group into the second, more pressing and dangerous selection of cards. Perhaps a prominent figure in high society has been accused of a despicable crime, or a city-wide curfew has been enforced. Perhaps a dangerous area of the city has been quarantined, cutting off access to some vital service or supply. An alarmingly serious food shortage suddenly struck Icarus as multiple 3D printers that are supposed to be dedicated to the agricultural sector of the city vanished. The lack of food is a human-centric problem though, and that just further sparked the tensions between us and the synthetics. I personally led investigations into the printer's disappearances, unaware that the AI system Abacus had been secretly stealing the printers away to faster construct the artistic monument in the centre of the city, obsessed with its own vanity project. The key thing about the cards that you draw on your turn is that although you'll still be discussing their outcomes as a group, the person who drew the card has the ultimate narrative control and decide what goes. This is really important for keeping the group's story collaborative, not allowing one player to run away with the story and leave the rest as mere onlookers. Once all the players have spent their die and resolved the card, you'll reach the resolution stage of the turn. First of all, the player who played first that turn will add a die to the tower to simulate the passing of time as the monument grows closer to completion. Then, in turn order, you'll roll the dice that each character placed and be faced with two possible results. After explaining what your character is trying to do or change, you'll either roll a success, which is any of these pillar symbols here, or a failure, which is any of the blank faces on the die. Now, you can have multiple characters working towards the same goal, so if at least one of you rolled a success symbol, then your action went as planned, and you can change, replace, or add to the aspect that your dice were assigned to. If you didn't roll any successes, then the situation that you tried to improve now escalates further, and all the dice that were assigned to that action are instead added to the monument, further destabilizing it and your city. You can probably guess where this is going. As the protests began to rage on in the city's tempers, escalated between the two groups. The human aggressors were labelled terrorists and the ringleaders were driven into detention camps. And as if that wasn't enough, the storm had finally reached us. The high acid content of the downpour revealed the true purpose of the monument. Corroded metal revealed hidden thrusters. It wasn't an art piece, but a vessel. The only source of the building plans was Abacus itself. What was it planning? The food was running out, the prison camps were overflowing, and Abacus offered a solution. Once a die has been placed on the tower, it can no longer be touched or stabilized. It seems like a minor detail, but the rounded edges of the dice make it surprisingly hard to place these on top of each other completely straight, and your tower will eventually start to lean, filled with chaotic kinetic energy teasing a fall. As it gets higher and higher, the tower will sway and start to strike the room with a tense 
anxiety. There's something special about the inclusion of dexterity to an RPG. In the same way that Dread asks players to remove a block from a Jenga tower rather than roll some dice. Even just writing on your little aspect sheets when the tower is frighteningly close to collapse makes you nervous as you lightly scrawl your notes on them so as not to shake the table. There will come a time at some point during the game where the inclusion of one more die will finally and inevitably collapse the tower. You've been building it from the beginning, and with the destruction of the monument, your society has collapsed. The city that you once knew, the sprawling civilization, the plucky young colonial town collapses in ashes and flame, flame, flame. The clashes between humans and synthetics grew into full scale, guerrilla conflict on the melting metal streets of Icarus. Commissioner Silas, the once mediator between each party and the glue holding artificial and organic life forms together was outed as a terror. Sympathizer by a mysterious source. The algorithm that runs the city continued its grim plan. The vessel it had been constructing almost completed, including the data storage necessary to upload a new clone of itself to the vessel. The now vilified Silas, after countless investigations into the corruption behind the destruction of his city, was brought before Abacus to learn of its plan before he was due to be formatted for his crimes against the city. Abacus planned to leave this dying earth and start its own Icarus in the stars, without the need or care for the fragility of humanity. And Silas had the honour of watching it happen before his execution. His execution. Once your civilization falls, the game asks three questions of you. What caused the monument to collapse? What happened to your characters in the aftermath? And what became of the civilization after its fall? With those answered, your story is complete and the world that you inhabit loses yet another cog in its machine. Perhaps you'll start another game in the ashes of your previous one or move to a completely different setting altogether. Regardless, you'll have told a truly memorable story. The one I've been flicking into every now and again is the first one I ever told in Icarus and I mean it when I say I couldn't stop thinking about it after the game was done. There was something about the way each card we drew just fed into the narrative that we were already creating. Events happening to our city didn't just feel like a disjointed list of bullet points, but a complicated web of interconnected catastrophes that made a domino chain leading to our destruction. We kept being surprised by our own stories and the way that they naturally evolved almost without our interference. We found ourselves stacking cards on top of each other as one of the crises became worse and worse over time, triggering the scaling of other issues across the city and stoking the fires of our imagination even more. In the epic conclusion of our story, with Silas imprisoned by the mad AI Abacus, Astrid tried to roll and upload her consciousness into the monument so that she could fly into space and attempt to found a new orbital AI-driven civilization and she failed. In most games, a fail constitutes the lack of something interesting happening. That move that you tried to pull flopped and you carry on with your tail, as if nothing ever happened. In our story, we put our heads together and decided that just as the command was running, the acid rainstorm overhead struck Abacus's housing unit with lightning and broke the part of the upload code that was supposed to delete the original copy of Abacus. This created two identical but consciously separate versions of the AI. Abacus 1, who was leaving the planet and destroying the city behind it, and Abacus 0, who was left in the cursed world that it had created. Absolute madness. I really, really love the omnipotent third-person perspective that you approach your story from in Icarus. You have a character, but they're just a pawn under your control, a cog in the machine of your story. The other playthroughs that I've had of this system have had a similar level of natural escalation as well. One notable and 
much more silly story that I told with some friends was of the first colony on Mars in which I declared myself the president and tried to enact a bill of Martian independence as there was literally rioting on the streets due to the mistreatment of our citizens. <laughs> it was as bonkers as it sounds, but that's only because we wanted it to be. And Icarus has a really fine balance between being too vague for you to have anything to work with and too specific as to lead you down certain paths. By treading that line carefully with its writing, the players are always in the driving seat and yet you won't feel too lost when answering the questions given to you in the game. I did have a few experiences where a card was drawn which was just so outside of the story that we were telling that we ended up discarding it and drawing a new one. So it's not a perfect system. The odds of you drawing a card and not going, ooh, are pretty low though. There's something that I have to mention before completely recommending Icarus to you and your friends though. This might be obvious to those of you that have tried to play a role-playing game before, but playing Icarus demands a group of creative people willing to improvise to unlock its true potential as a game. A lot of the time when reviews are written, it can be easy to answer the question of, is this a good game worth playing? It is, it really is. And slightly harder to answer the question of, is this a game that me and my friends will actually enjoy? This is where I want to advise some caution, not, not like a massive amount of caution because this game will only set you back like $35. And at the time of writing this review, and I, it's a discount, so I don't know if it's gonna stay like that, but you can grab the digital version for about $10 and drive through RPG, but caution nonetheless. And by the way, I'll pop that link in the description. If this game really excites you, and I hope it does because it deserves your excitement, ask yourself if the group that you'll be playing this with will share that excitement with you. In any game that asks you to collaboratively tell a story, having even one person in the group that's having a bad time will likely sort of sabotage the enjoyment of the game that everyone else is having. Not to mention that that person is having a bad time, which is not good for a game night. That's the last thing you want from your game night. It might be the case that you're planning to play this with people who have never attempted any kind of role-playing experience before, perhaps even including yourself, and honestly, that's absolutely fine. This is not a complicated system. The rules are not that in depth, but I would just recommend asking your friends and possibly yourself, would you like to tell a story together? If the answer is yes, then I can't think of a better box around right now that will let you tell that story than Icarus. Thank you so much for watching this review of Icarus. I hope that it looks as cool to you as I think it is because I think it is so, so cool. Um, I would just be very, very quick in saying that I think this game is slowly selling out, but as I said, it's available digitally. I haven't played it with the digital components. I don't know what it's like to play with a, a deck of playing cards rather than the cards that you can get, but I think you can just buy the deck of cards separately as well. But as I said, all the links in the description. If you enjoyed this video, and I hope you did, then you can see more videos popping up at the bottom of the screen, just like it, where we talk about other games that we like. We also do some playthroughs uh, and also some great live streams as well if you come and join us each week, where we like to do painting and also playing. So please give us a subscribe, click on the bell icon if you'd like to see when we get our videos up so that you can watch them as soon as they're live. And thanks very much for watching Dicebreaker and have a lovely day.